Professor Carol Clark, thank yeah. you so much for uh, joining me on the podcast today. How are you, first of all? Very well, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Great. And uh, yeah, very interesting to be in a in a in a recording studio. Yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you our proper recording studios after this. <laughs> then you won't think so much of this one, I don't think. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, um, I think first things first. Let's just get straight to uh, what's coming up this week, which is uh, coming on Friday. A women's Health Symposium. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, you know, what, what's it all for? What sort of things will be covered? That, that sort of thing. So um, uh, we're very lucky that our PGR student, uh, Rosie Harper, uh, has a very keen interest in, in women's health. Um, and at the same time, and, and so she's been organising this and she raised the funding. So she raised the funding from the Doctoral College and through WAN, the Women's Academic Network. Um, she, her PhD is around uh, women's health uh, and in particular uh, management of um, uh, incontinence in women pre-pregnancy and post-pregnancy or maybe through, through life. Um, and at the same time, we have uh, changed the Centre for Midwifery, Maternal and Perinatal Health to the Centre for Midwifery and Women's Health. And the reason behind that is because we want to link in with the Women's Health Strategy. The Women's Health Strategy for the UK uh, was published uh, last year in August 2022 uh, and the Women's Health Ambassador uh, is Dame Leslie Regan who is going to open the conference. So it's, it's linking all, all these elements together. Mm, fantastic. This is specifically a PGR conference, and so Which all means the postgraduate researchers. researchers. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so all the all the research is is from them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so uh, after uh, uh, Leslie Regan's keynote, then each of the uh, PGRs uh, are going to uh, have have their chance to. Uh, showcase their research and then we will have some posters up um, uh, in in an adjacent room and some networking from four o'clock to five o'clock oh that's fantastic and it's this friday what's the date on friday i should have um, written that down it's uh, <laughs> friday the 14th friday the 14th just in case uh, people are watching this after friday and they think oh it's on this friday oh, which, so friday the 14th, 14th of july 2023 that's <laughs> say. right yeah um and uh it will it's online as well so we've got quite a few people coming uh, on, joining us online. Mm. So the online will be from two uh, to four, um, and then the networking from four to five, uh, which will obviously for be for people, uh, uh, you know, in person. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So it's a really good chance, as you say, to showcase the postgraduates' work, um, and hopefully give them a bit of a springboard into into becoming fully fledged academics as well. Is this, is Absolutely. This, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Um, so you mentioned the Women's Academic Network. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? What, what is that, and what, what are its aims? Do you, um, are you familiar with that? Uh, I am. They, they, they're. I, I mean, I think the Women's Academic Network is a sort of support uh, uh, group within the university. They have their own sort of uh, email list. Everybody's welcome onto it, uh, but they do try and raise uh, sort of women's issues, um, and. Uh, I'm I'm not a member of their, uh, you know, the their sort of the the leaders leadership group, uh, but it does keep us in contact with what what's going on uh, around the university and externally, uh, and they organise lectures and and talks and things, um, but I think that also links in with uh, Athena Swan, mm. uh, and obviously the university is looking to uh, get an institutional Athena Swan. Uh, we have got. Bronze, but obviously these sort of uh, um, each each you know after several years you try and a apply for silver Athena Swan and then gold Athena Swan, right. um, uh, and uh, we various departments across the university are also applying for their uh, uh, Athena Swan mm. uh, badge, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Athena Swan is about equality in general, is it? Yes, e yeah. equality in general. Uh, mm. Yeah, across across the board. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, what was the other thing I was going to ask you? Um, oh, yeah. So this is what I was going to ask. So um, can I ask why uh, the focus on women's 
academic um, network and women's health specifically, uh, both both from your personal perspective and perhaps um, a strategic perspective? You know, why is there such a focus at the moment on helping women more so than men or just everyone in general? You know, 20 years ago, there probably wasn't these things that are called like, sort of labelled women's a thing maybe there were some but it seems more more prevalent today uh, can you explain why that is to people wondering you know why is there all this sort of it feels like favoritism or on women or something <laughs> like that. if someone said that what, what, what are your thoughts on that <laughs> um <coughs> I, uh, yes whether it's maybe maybe we start with that favoritism okay um uh women have heart attacks just like men have heart attacks and and suffer from heart disease it's their biggest killer um and yet only 25 percent of the research is done in women who have heart attacks right. <laughs> um women who have a stroke are more likely to be ignored because they get different symptoms to a man who's having a stroke uh, and the same with a heart attack so uh it's there is a need to focus uh, our research and our understanding of of women's issues and it's not just women, women's health as in women's pelvic health women who are pregnant uh etc it or, or have a you know the menstruation and 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 postmenopausal or premenopausal or whatever it, it's about uh the way in which women's women uh their, how they, their health that that we've looked at predominantly in men. Mm. So, for example, another another example is that um, children with uh, developmental coordination disorder, which is dyspraxia, gen we always thought that it was predominantly uh, a condition that boys uh, presented with, right. and so boys are are, are um, referred to. A, uh, child health uh, for their diagnosis and then for their treatment. The reason children, boys, are presented uh, and referred on is because they're the disruptors in the classroom. I see. Girls with the same condition sit at the back of the classroom very quietly and don't necessarily engage. So they have a completely different set of symptoms, but they've got the same same condition. But they present in a different way, and that often goes unnoticed uh, throughout their life until you know some, something happens and, and, and suddenly look suddenly finds it. If mm. you see what I mean, yeah. it's the same with autism. Um, that's another uh, condition that predominantly is seen in in males, or or that's when it's diagnosed in young boys and young males it's less likely to be diagnosed in women because right. they seem to hide it a little okay. bit more. Right. Um, do, do you think those differences in um, the outward behaviour of the same condition is um, a, a genetic thing or do you think it's a cultural, uh, the, way, the way girls and boys are raised differently? Like why, why would there be that difference? In all fairness, I, I, I don't know the answer mm. uh, to, to that. Um, uh, but it's it, it's not just say for example you know that uh, I've talked about there about autism and, and dyspraxia. We know for example with chronic pain, more women suffer from chronic pain uh, than men. Um, I uh, I did my own PhD uh, research around a condition called joint hypermobility syndrome, which uh, also is uh, uh, similar to Ilias Danlos. Uh, hypermobility syndrome. People, you may have heard of Ilias Danlos, but Ilias Danlos. <laughs> I have not, to be honest. <laughs> but please enlighten me. <laughs> Ilias Danlos syndrome and, and joint hypermobility syndrome are, are part of a uh, genetic uh, connect, group of connective tissue disorders where um, people have a, uh, a lot, many symptoms. Um, and uh, and again, the the prevalence of that condition is higher amongst women mm -hmm. uh, that, than men. Uh, in my own study, which was looking at those uh, patients who attended a clinic I in London, uh, you know, ninety two percent were 
were women uh, and only you know eight percent were, were men right. um and and that's a condition with multiple manifestations so for that's example, a huge difference isn't it it's a big di- big big difference wow. and that's a condition that is kind of we call a, an invisible condition because a it's not not many people know about it mm. uh it's under under recognized by many clinicians um but it's got a it, and again it's it's a very complex condition it, it comes with not only chronic pain uh but people uh might have what we call postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome which they get sort of uh dizziness and a heart high heart rate um they uh they may have um symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome uh, and yet they don't actually have an irritable bowel but the symptoms are are like that Mm. um, because they've got a sort of functional gastrointestinal uh, problem Um, and then uh, so and then they yeah as I say the different types of pain so they may have pain in many joints they may have dislocations they tend to be very bendy or can be some of them tend to be bendy um wh- when i talk about bendy or hypermobile i'm talking about what you might see amongst gymnasts mm. and ballerinas that sort of uh, where the joints sort of go beyond uh sort of Hyper, beyond hyperextension, hyperextension. Yeah, yeah. yeah i'm aware of that because right. I, I i snapped my acl once and oh <laughs> yeah oh yeah. very that was painful yes, that was painful yes. yeah that's right yeah. and my wife's done both of hers on both legs as oh, well right. playing netball okay. so I, pl- I did football yeah, so hers was probably a netball um yeah so the, we're, we're both familiar with that oh uh, that, well now coming back that's interesting because uh with the recent recent explosion of football mm. uh Fo- f- a women's football well women yeah women's football yep. Uh, women are more likely to have ACL ruptures than men for the, the same number of playing uh, hours. Uh, uh, so uh, that's a that's a, 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 and and that you know that we've got data dating back to uh, in they looked at this quite a lot in the states uh, with their soccer mm-hmm. um, and because they had they brought in a lot of women into soccer scholarships in in the universities. Uh, in America, um, you know, well over 20 years ago. Um, uh, and that was something they began to see was, yeah, they were getting many more ACL ruptures in women compared okay. with men. So Interesting. So just to return to the original question that I probed about favouritism, uh, <laughs> this is actually more like a levelling of the playing field, so to speak. Excuse That's the pun. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, be- because women suffer from these problems more, uh, they go unnoticed more. This yeah. is more about balancing the books. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Consider myself yeah. educated on that point. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, okay. Um, what else was I going to ask on that point? Um, oh, so okay. So the the women's academic network is a specific one that I've that I've heard. Obviously, it's been emailed around and things like this. Um, so so you've justified very nicely there why uh, we need to sort of level this playing field. But from my perspective, being a male. Um, who also feels like I need help from time to time, it does feel a little bit exclusory at, at times. Um, and it, it feels like there's lots of things at the moment, you know, to promote women. And obviously there are things that naturally men can also do that are just, you know, non-gendered at all. But it feels like when you see the title, you know, um, Women's Academic Networks, like, okay, well, I don't feel invited to that almost. Do you know what I mean? So do, do you have any sort of response to that? or uh, Especially, I think, for maybe 20-year-old tw- um, men at the moment or you know emerging and they, they see they see this world where they're told you know there's this sort of patriarchal uh, um, control and all this but then they feel within themselves you know maybe I don't feel like I have that power myself you know above many women who I know um, and yet the focus is on sort of turning that table somehow the table that does to me doesn't feel like it, it needs to be turned do you have any kind of thoughts on um, on that? Because that, that's almost an issue in itself. Is how do we level this out without kind of discriminating in any way? A- absolutely. I mean, <coughs> I've I've had this conversation with my uh, son-in-law, <laughs> uh, who who uh, would agree with you absolutely, absolutely entirely. Um, in all fairness, uh, I I don't have any answers 
what what I see um, what I see is um, a big challenge. If we go back, a big challenge for women who are striving uh, to be the best, you know, at work, at home, as a mother, and putting themselves under enormous strain. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't men who are also helping with the family. Yeah. Um, and, and so I'm not, I'm not necessarily answering your question because I actually don't quite know the answer myself it's a, it's a difficult one isn't it and yeah. I, you know I, I'm, I'm I th- just to just to clarify as well I, I understand there's a problem that needs that needs addressing in terms of you know leveling things out for women so I'm not saying that should disappear but I'm just not certain that this is the correct solution at the moment to but I don't know either <laughs> I, I, I certainly <coughs> think that we need to uh, we need to work to understand what are the barriers I mean what, what, what you want to do is to enable everybody hmm. to achieve their potential, um, and uh, and and obviously that that's got to be done in, in different ways. I look at my colleagues uh, uh, coming back to work after having uh, had um, children and trying to work in a, a very competitive hmm. academic uh, atmosphere, uh, and I think I think it I think it's really tough. It's a massive um, challenge. Yeah. A mass- massive challenge. Mm. Um, you might feel the same being a yeah, father. But I do, but the, I think yeah. I think that's certainly to a lesser extent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think women definitely, you know, just going through that whole process, the body changing and all that stuff is a massive challenge in itself. And then having to refocus on your career after, you know, nurturing this baby for a year or, ha- you know, two years over the, the full processes of sort of, you know, being off work and all that stuff is a tremendous challenge. That, that's right. And I mean, I... Um, so I... Uh, I look at my own, uh, uh, what, what I did, I, I, we happened to be working in the Middle East uh, at the time that I had my uh, first child and uh, um, they gave you 40 days maternity leave um, and then I went back to work but they did give you time for breastfeeding so I would do uh, three hours ago, uh, I, I had somebody to help with childcare I'd go home, breastfeed, came back mm. for a couple of hours, and so it was. It was uh, a, a more split up day. Now I I managed that for for a year, uh, year just over a year or something, and then uh, I was pregnant again, and I thought, well, I I I think I'm going to take a break now because I couldn't go part time. Uh, it was either work full time or not at all. Uh, so I took. Why the, why was that? Uh, that Mo- that was the 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 laws in the country. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. They didn't. Uh, yeah. So my other my colleagues who uh, who you know some of them, uh, especially national colleagues, you know carried on carried on working. Um, and uh, but yeah, that they, they only got uh, that short time. So it, it it's something that that's something that's worked out slightly differently. Um, and then we went to. Um, we then moved to Nigeria, where I could only work in the voluntary sector, but that was obviously very part time. Uh, the work, the work that I did there, uh, and then. Uh, right. What What were you doing in the Middle East initially? Uh, it was really we followed my husband's career, okay. but uh, I worked in a um, uh, a the national oil company um, occupational health clinic as a physiotherapist. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, so that, that was uh, very interesting. I used to, uh, uh, I was working in, we were working in Qatar, so I used to work in Doha, which was the capital. And then one day a week I had to travel to the other side of the peninsula um, uh, to Dukan, where we had a small clinic. And the small clinic also used to look after um, uh, the Bedouin, the local tribal uh, group over over there. Wow. Um, and that that was interesting. I had uh, uh, I I knew a little bit of Arabic, but not brilliant. And I uh, I could always rely on a translator coming in and and helping me. And I remember one day uh, two ladies coming in, uh, obviously fully masked up and um, very very friendly, very M- chatty. Masked up as in terms well, of as the, in the they tribal. had the tribal oh, mask. And and obviously their hijab, uh, you know, mm. they were fully dressed up. Right. 
um, and the lady had a, a, a sore knee, so we didn't. I did an examination and I treated her. And I said, well, maybe she could come back and see me in a week's time. I gave her some exercises to do. Uh, you know, we had a good good laugh about her, you know, doing the exercises and things like that. Uh, and I came back, and then the next week, the two ladies came back in, uh, and the lady sort of lifted up her uh, sort of trousers for me to have a look at her knee. And I said, said to the translator, oh, this doesn't appear to be the same knee as I was seeing yesterday, uh, you know, last week. Was it, it was the opposite knee? No, it was the same. It was the right hand knee, right. but it didn't look like the same knee. So he quickly he chatted to them. They said, "Oh yes, it was her sister," and uh, her sister was coming to see me this time. And I said, "Well, hang on. Well, last week was a referral from. Did we, have we got another referral? Was it? No, no, no. They like to share things. So if one gets uh, something, the other must have the same thing as well." So. <laughs> That would give you an eth- ethical dilemma, didn't it? <laughs> so, so wait, does this mean that they went out of their way to injure her knee in order for her to feel the same pain? Is this what you mean, or is it that no, they just no, she, wanted to she, share she, the share the experience? Oh, okay, well that's an interesting yeah. way of approaching things, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean. that that that's what I gained from the translator. <laughs> anyway, the they were very they uh, they were quite animatedly telling the translator. Uh, you know what what they wanted, right. um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> Always... fascinating. What a fascinating yeah. experience to have worked over there. <laughs> what did your husband do? Out of curiosity, or what does he do? Yes, he worked for the oil industry. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably something that <laughs> sounds negative, but actually, well, uh, just, you know, it's one uh, one of those things we can't at the moment we can't live without oil, can we? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Let's not let's not delve down let's that controversial that topic. One. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, in terms of uh, leveling out the playing field, um, what what we're saying is basically this stuff is is necessary um, and. <clears throat> Um, perhaps a solution, another solution needs to be found to not disempower young men at the moment. I, I do think there is uh, mm. some sort of um, kind of issue with that at the moment as well, myself. Uh, but perhaps that's a, a separate issue. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I agree. I think mm. we, we need strategies that empower both men and women. Everyone, and those, as you say, yeah. Uh, everyone. Mm. Uh, everyone. Mm. And, and those strategies might need to be a little different uh, because the needs uh, of of all of us are, sli- are slightly different. So how you bring on women who have um, who are coming back from maternity leave might be different to how you empower um, young men coming straight, you know, say, for example, straight into academia mm. um, from, a, you know, having done a, a PhD. Or, so I, I think we need, we need different strategies. And mm. I think you're absolutely right. We must not ignore uh, young men who, who, may, who, who may need uh, confidence building. Mm. You know, it's I didn't mean to hijack the conversation and push this into men's rights territory, yeah. by the way, in case anyone <laughs> no. listening is thinking, hang on, why are we talking about men's rights here when it's, yeah. the, you know... It, but it's it, it, it's it, it's the yeah, and it's the rights of everybody, isn't mm, it? Absolutely, yeah. 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 But but I think you're absolutely right in um in the uh, you know pre- pregnancy specifically is a massive thing that can um you know potentially detriment women's careers. Um, do you think that's do you think that's often the case that it that they find it then to harder to keep up with male colleagues who have had you know the two years or whatever of just continuous progress. Um, and because there's that gap, do you think some women then find it harder to sort of catch up or keep up? It, you know, that's an interesting conversation. Um, I think it's, uh, I think Goldman Sachs or something offers paternity leave, mm. six months paternity leave, and yet not many men want to take that paternity leave mm. because. I believe, anyway, this is what I've heard, is because they feel that then they won't be around to, you know, to progress, to, to take progress. the opportunities and whatnot. Mm. My own, from my own experience, that time out, uh, uh, you know, bringing up your children, 
uh, and doing voluntary work uh, and juggling, I have never found as being negative. In fact, I found it as being uh, my, you know, as being the foundations for sort of leadership and and organisation. So, uh, for example, I went when we went to live in Oman. Um, I took on the role of deputy head of department, and my head of department wasn't really there. Um, we had to build the uh, rehabilitation uh, program across across the country. Um, I was given the opportunity to do that, um, and so I felt that uh, all the voluntary work and the work working with the children, and I used to sometimes help out as a, a class mum and things like that. All of that had helped me in in developing my skills, my leadership skills, mm. uh, and communicating and things like that with with others. Um, and then I was able to use that, uh, you know, when I came to Bournemouth University because, right. uh, you know, I started um, when I was in Oman. I actually didn't even have a degree because when I trained as a physiotherapist, uh, we got a graduate diploma back in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, it wasn't until the 2000s that I went off and, and got a master's degree um, and then uh, later on joined Bournemouth University mm -hmm. uh, and then did a PhD um, and so uh, I think it I think I think women uh, need to reflect on the fact that uh, bringing up a family and maybe doing some part-time work and juggling all the other commitments around looking after maybe uh, elderly pa parents or being a caregiver, all of those things are giving you uh, e uh, experience um, that you can use uh, in in building your career. Now, I maybe you, you know it, that won't be the case for every career, mm -hmm. but I think it's something that people people should consider that's a really interesting insight i think maybe that um that maybe your perspective on that has helped you turn it into a positive do you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, you know perhaps others they're thinking of it as a negative and so it becomes a negative almost as a perhaps yeah yeah something along those lines i think it, and the other thing is um taking opportunities all, mm. all the way along i've had to take opportunities for example put yourself forward and be confident in your own abilities and, and yeah. sort of you know put your hand up put my hand up mm. that's right I'm not saying I'm confident every time I put my hand up <laughs> I'm not necessarily uh, is it a fake confidence sometimes it, it will be a f yes <laughs> that's yeah, a skill in that's itself right. though isn't it that's a skill in itself <laughs> or um <laughs> but not being too worried about being uh, out of my comfort zone mm. Uh, or the fear of failure and that that sort of thing. Absolutely, mm. I've failed so many times that it's probably not a. It's no longer a problem. Mm. All the way through school, I fa failed <laughs> in various <laughs> exams and tests. And uh, you know, um, I remember when I first uh, got to my secondary school, <laughs> and I wanted to go out and play hockey. And they said, "Hang on, you're so small. We don't want you getting hurt, so we don't want you on the hockey team." <laughs> oh, God. I could go to hockey practice. Well, of course, that made me really determined. <laughs> <laughs> did you make it to the team eventually? I did. Good on you. I did. I eventually captained the first team. <laughs> wow, well done. What a story. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's things like that, I think. Um, and I think that if you do, if you have had failure mm. um, and uh, you can come back for it, it's, it's just like all the way through academia, isn't it? You know, rejection after rejection, whether it's a paper or a, and you put it in again and things like that, uh, or whether it's a you know a grant, uh, you know how, how many how many rejections do you get? <laughs> it's I, multiple. I, I, I'm not an academic, I'm, I'll be honest, but I get lots of other rejections in life. Don't worry. <laughs> we have to sort of think. Oh well, you know, I'll I'll grow from that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's still it's still uh, at the moment for me. It's still a little bit of a blow. I guess it is for everyone. It's always a, a blow. A oh, little absolutely. Bit to your ego and whatnot. But, oh, yeah. But as you say, yeah. the, the more often you feel that feeling, the more you get used to it, and the more it just doesn't mean anything anymore. I, I often think that about a lot of things in life. You know, the first time you do anything, yeah, that's one hundred percent. It represents a hundred percent of the experience of that particular thing. So it's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. The second time. 50 percent you know third time 33 percent and yeah. so on and so forth until eventually 
you know, it's one percent of your entire experience of doing that thing if you've done it a hundred times. Suddenly, it's you know, yeah, whatever kind of thing. Yeah. So I guess that's that's the message, isn't it, for people is to um, you fail and feel comfortable with failing that's until right. you become a success. Or something. Yeah, and mm. but isn't it funny how uh, when my kids were at school, uh, you know, for for a, I, I remember sports days were all about taking part, and I'm all all for that. Mm. but nobody won or lost <laughs> mm. they used to have sports days where nobody won or lost <laughs> I think we have that yeah my, my children have or my, my eldest has a similar sort of ethos at the moment yeah and and so you're thinking so <laughs> we're not learning at to an early age from it. failure mm. and how to take it mm. and I'm saying to you that I think I failed so many times as I was going <laughs> along my my journey through through school that I that I learned. Mm. Um, That's a very good point. You know, so I wonder. You know, I I don't have all the answers at all, but I wonder whether that's something that sort of builds your own resilience. I think so. Yeah, um, yeah. And we do have a tendency to sugarcoat things for children a little bit these days, um, which, as you say, is detrimental in that respect. Definitely yeah. To, yeah. to the life lessons you need to learn. Yeah. You, if, if you want to be a success at things, anyway. Yeah, you need to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, le- learn the learn the hard way. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, Carol, I wonder. Um, I did a bit of research um, uh, into your research that you've done, and I wonder if we could talk a little bit about some of this this stuff because some of it sounds really interesting and intriguing. Uh, the first one um, that I that I came across: non pharmacological management of pain. Um, so, is this a study that that you did uh, in tandem with other, with others? Um, you know, talk um, to us a little bit. About yeah, this. so that. Uh, that's kind of probably a sort of an ethos. So as a physiotherapist, I have not uh, uh, done any education around um, prescribing. You can, as a physiotherapist, learn to become an independent prescriber. I didn't know that. But, uh, but I'm, I'm not. Uh, and so uh, the pharmacological, non-pharmacological management of pain, uh, my experience is about being around... Um, managing people with joint hypermobility syndrome, as I was m- alluding to earlier, mm-hmm. so they had they have a chronic pain condition, um, uh, and it's about understanding um, where chronic pain comes from, how it how it manifests, um, and how you can help people to self manage their pain. So giving them strategies uh, for self management. So um, so that that's that's the sort of background behind it. So it, it, it's about managing chronic pain. Okay. I, uh, we've currently got a, a, a PhD student, Bronwyn, who is, is looking at the contextual factors of low back pain. So the contextual factors uh, around um, a consultation uh, around back pain. Uh, and and uh, the sort of interesting findings there are... Um, the there are sort of five contextual factors um one is the the patient's beliefs about and characteristics about back pain mm, another one is the relationship between the therapist or the the clinician and, and the patient um another one might be the um the beliefs and characteristics of the clinician um another one might be the environment so these are these are different contextual factors that may help modulate pain reduce it or or might enhance it okay what do you mean by the environment can we just elaborate on that one a little bit more yeah so the the environment might be <clears throat> coming into a busy hospital uh with hospital smells um and uh, and feeling out of place, the receptionist being a bit brusque to you as you sit down in the waiting room, uh, an empty, cold, or a cold, busy waiting room that feels in, uh, unper- you know not personal, mm. uh, going into a cubicle where a curtain is drawn round you, but next door to the, in the next door cubicle is another patient with a therapist. 
uh, and you can hear their conversation as much as you can try and hear your conversation with therapists. All of those sorts of things right, okay. that uh, don't help a patient feel comfortable so the, uh, so in their in, envir- the environment of the, the, the hospital. Okay, and, and then that, and that the hypothesis sort of thing is that this then feeds into the feeling of chronic pain. Is this what you mean? It sort of affects it, that somehow. Yeah, it can. It doesn't help you to yeah to feel in a comfortable situation. Mm. And again, the sort of twenty minute consultation when actually you've had this pain for many years. This is maybe the twentieth clinician. And you've repeated you've, yourself. Yeah. over and over again to That's these right. people and yeah. you know that in 20 minutes mm. you're never going to be able to get to the bottom of your mm. your your the, the 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 problem or never going to be able to explain the story mm. uh yet again so uh, compare that then with uh coming into a quiet waiting room with carpets, with with uh, comfortable seating, uh, the receptionist is welcoming. You go in to see the clinician. They've got you know an hour to see you. Uh, they allow you to tell their story. Um, and These are really important things that um, that often I think just get forgotten about in that's, hospitals. That's right. And medical s- scenarios in general. I mean, hospitals are horrible places to be in. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Generally. So, yeah, gen- absolutely. Mm. I mean, we and we understand the pressure that they everybody of works course. at, mm. but it doesn't. Uh, both the clinicians and the patients recognise this as not always the best place to be getting your treatment, especially mm. if it's a sort of a long-term problem mm. um, and you've had many visits uh, to the hospital. And certainly these are the things that people with joint hypermobility syndrome said were, I'll go in for a physio appointment or I'll go and see a, you know, another clinician or whatever, and they're not listening. They're not listening to the story I've got to tell. And, it, and in a way it's not surprising because they know they've got a waiting list of another uh, Ten that morning, they know that they've yeah. got to. They know that they've got to, uh, you know, try and keep to time. Mm. Uh, and in that anxiety of trying to keep to time, they they aren't necessarily listening. Yeah, of course. Um, it, you know, it's a really really tricky tricky very, situation. I, get, I imagine it's very hard for it not to just become a job. You know, yeah. yeah, this is a job. I just need to get through this list of people. Yes, that's right. Mm. It, and uh, and I, you know, I was talking to a colleague. Um, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, and she was saying, "Oh, you know, really bad." The other day, the computer system went down for ten or fifteen minutes. Wow, oh, you know, you can't do anything because all the notes are on the on the on the computer. Mm. And then, you know, you don't know who's coming in next. You don't, you know, and and you you're, you're brought to a standstill. Then you're ten fifteen minutes late mm. for the for the rest of the day. If you said to me, yeah. So I think computers are a particular. Uh, a paradox aren't they you know they've they've helped massively but they also ah. seem to hinder a lot of the time that's right you, you know the number of times i've been to a receptionist they say oh sorry the computer system's playing up today or something <laughs> yeah know, and it's causing yeah. them stress uh, there's a uh, queue of people waiting absolutely. and then that sort of thing that's right you know an email's pinging every every two minutes as well is just a it's just an extra additional pressure i i have this uh, theory which i'm sure is probably written about somewhere um but that as technology improves we assume that that technology is going to allow us to live more free and less stress stressful lives but in fact it does almost the opposite it just allows us to be more efficient and more productive and therefore our expectations of how much output we have go up in line with the technology that's helped yeah no, Do you know I, what i mean yep yeah, absolutely and i and and so when it doesn't work uh we're really stuck absolutely yeah. you know i mean for example today uh, if if today we couldn't get into our our email for mm. get online, you know, for half an hour or something, 
I wouldn't know why, where my next appointment was. And if, we, if we've got a Teams meeting, well, I'll have missed that as well. Mm. Do, do, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? We've, yeah. Whereas, do, do you keep a paper diary I don't. to anyone? No, do neither, you? No, no, do I, no. No, I know, I I mean, know a I couple of people to. still do, yeah. I used to. But but there's something quite nice about that as well. I might go back to that, you know, make little notes in a journal or something. Yeah. I've, I've often tried to keep a journal throughout my life, but it never quite sticks. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of weeks and then I get bored of it. Yeah. But Jan- then I look back at those two weeks. January you know, the few, first. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. The New Year's resolution type yeah. thing, and it oh, drops This off year, I'll keep a diary. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to come back to the the first point you made as well about um, uh, about these five factors. Um, the first one was how people uh, approach their own pain. What they, what, you know, is it their own culture? I think you might have said. I can't remember um, what you said now. But yeah. No. Uh, well, it's your patient, <clears throat> your beliefs, beliefs and, that's and the characteristics. Word, yeah. mm. Okay. So, uh, whatever. However, people get to hear about their beliefs. I've I've heard people coming in and saying, "I mustn't move. I've slipped a disc, uh, and if I bend, that disc will pop out." And you're wondering, what's going on? What what's the picture? What's the picture that person is seeing of that disc slipping out? Or I will hear mm. somebody say, I, "You know, I've I've." I can't move, I've slipped a disc, it's going to pop out, am I going to end up in a wheelchair? And you're thinking, wow, so where where did you get to all of those, uh, how did you line those dots up? Mm. Where did Uh, the knowledge come from? Where did the knowledge come from? Mm. You know, is it from, you know, an aunt or something who started with back pain and ended up in a wheelchair or something, you know, we we need to get to the bottom of that to, to understand... Um, where that pain idea came from. I see. So do you often ask that question? You know, you know what, what gives you that impression of that, that that's going to happen? Do you often ask that? That's right. Mm. I, I've, I, I didn't t- to begin with, mm. but once I began to sort of study this uh, in a little bit more depth and understand people's fears about their pain, yes, that's something that I, I try and get to the bottom of. Um, and And... So that kind of feeds into uh, the work that I've done I- around pregnancy and pain. So, for example, when I was telling colleagues in our faculty, Faculty of Health, back in uh, probably 2011, when I was talking about my PhD and how I'd done work around pain, I remember one of our professors of nursing saying, saying to us, oh, well, don't talk to the midwives about pain because they don't believe that pain is important. <laughs> um, anyway, at, at some stage, I got chatting to Professor Venora Hundley, who is a professor in midwifery, um, and we started to put t- together uh, some projects. Uh, and our, we had our first PhD student um, uh, looking at at, at pain management uh, in labour. Mm. Uh, so Professor Venora Hunley is uh, her her research is around early labour, early labour pain. Okay. <clears throat> and she specifically has been doing a lot of work around. Uh, um, is this like the uh, what do they call it? Bra- Braxton. Braxton Hicks. Hicks. Braxton Hicks are a sort of the uterus sort of uh, contracting, mm. um, and some people get Braxton Hicks. Uh, towards probably towards the end of their pregnancy, okay. um, as a maybe as a practice, or, or that's what you you hear about, isn't it? it that it's that, that the muscles are practicing contracting. Oh, I see. Ready, um, for, ready for the big event. Ready for the big event. <laughs> Some people don't seem to get Braxton Hicks. Uh, it, you know, it's not until <coughs> they they begin to go into labour that they get that. But that's that sort of yeah. So early labour is um, the sort of contractions that uh, the uterus is getting ready uh, for the delivery and the cervix is beginning to to dilate. So early labour is before uh, the dilatation of of about four to five centimetres, depending on whether you look at the UK recommendations or the WHO recommendations or the (coughs) US recommendations, because they all have slightly different... Oh, really? uh, I had no idea. (laughs) No, that's right. I've I've learned this along the way. It's not Mm. necessarily something a a physiotherapist necessarily learns, Mm. but um, the midwives have taught me. (laughs) Um, uh, so So the aim was to try and help women 
manage their pain in 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 early labor um, and looking at how the sorts of things that we use in to manage musculoskeletal pain uh, so one of the things was keeping women moving uh, mm. during that early labor uh, and so we did a randomized control trial on the Isle of Wight uh, looking at using a birth ball to keep people upright mm. and moving because again if you stay upright then uh, you're uh, more uh, the gravity helps you uh, with, with birthing and if yeah, you, can, you don't need to be fighting against another that's thing. right <laughs> you know gravity on top of everything else you go through. well that's right so which is what happened when people were then uh, put into a birthing room and laid flat on their back you've mm. no longer got gravity mm. working to help you to give birth that's why it's quite nice to be upright and in a pool yes uh, but we've also upright and on bean bags or upright and on uh, you know on a on a on a on a ball ball yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, physios call it the Swiss ball uh, I imagine the Swiss must have uh, invented it or something <laughs> and and and, and uh, midwives call it a birthing ball okay <laughs> um, uh, but we so we we had a, a you know a trial looking looking at that the the aim is to uh, if women come into uh, hospital too early they're more likely to have an intervention that means a cesarean or oh, a, yeah. an epidural or, or any uh, any of the other interventions that's really interesting because i remember from our experience of um our first i think so more than our second um yeah we, we called them fairly early on and they kept saying you know give it a bit longer give it a bit longer yeah and yeah come so that's obviously the reason that's right. Because that, we yeah, were wondering, right. you know, why can't we just come in now? Like my wife was, you know, come on, I need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, so it's uh, so we, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is, and, and at the moment, so within that has built into a second study, um, and now we're trying to sort of, uh, you know, yeah, use that work uh, to try and inform women uh, about what they can do to support themselves. So. The, one of the most common, one of the commonest reasons women come into uh, a birthing centre in early labour is because they can no longer manage the pain. Mm. Um, and uh, what what we have found uh, in in our research is that um, some women will what we call uh, are more likely. Uh, have beliefs and characteristics that mean that 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 pain they associate with a lot of damage or they associate negatively um and that more so than men would you mean uh, it's hard to no. say surely with the pregnancy thing oh <laughs> yes yeah. you just mean I, I don't think i don't it this isn't sort of necessarily <clears throat> uh comparison between male and females because um, males will also uh, we, we, we term it catastrophize about their pain mm. um, sometimes I think that's not it, it's not a, a, a great term it's the way in which we we measure it or talk about it yeah, um, I think it's a fairly s but uh, it, it's it's a feeling term. it's a feeling of um, uh, that 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 pain may be causing more damage more injury um and and men will feel it as well um i you know obviously uh, this this work has been around women and mm -hmm. and women uh we've looked at university students both here uh and in nepal um and uh and, and looked at the sort of prevalence of of pain catastrophizing right uh, so it's there early on in life um, but yes, so following following any surgery, some people will ask for more pain relief, mm. uh, probably because they are are catastrophizing about their pain. So it's about their pain beliefs. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to reduce that catastrophizing around pain, uh, maybe you need to put something in place preoperatively to say, um, 
you will feel pain Man- afterwards. Manage the You're expectations. Not, yeah, help mm. manage the expectations. Do you think this mm. is another case of uh, sort of what we were talking about earlier about um, early experience of pain? And if 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 you've hurt yourself a hundred times by the time you're ten, it doesn't mean much anymore. That, do you think it could be down to that as well, and, and a cultural difference between certain people who are maybe protected from a young age, whereas some maybe uh, rough and tumble and they're hurting themselves every day and then they just get on with it because they're so used to it. Do you think there's an element of that? or I don't want to put words in your mouth. But <laughs> uh, there, there might be, mm. but there's probably a genetic... There's, you know, there's something... There's nature versus nurture, isn't there? Yeah. So there's some... The ever-ongoing um, debate that I have in my mind when I'm raising my children. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've got two girls, so I'm always just wondering, you know. Yeah. Wait, what, <laughs> Do they love babies because we've given them the babies? Or is this some sort of genetic predisposition to wanting to care and nurture? I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean... It that, boggles my mind. Yeah, no, it, is, it is interesting because mm. you do see that with girls, I think. I had a girl and a boy. Okay. Uh, and I don't think my little boy was that interested in nurturing teddy bears or, or, or dolls. Mm. He wasn't. He much preferred to pick up a car or, a, you know, uh, you know, or an aeroplane or, a, you, you know, anything. Uh, and I also see that with my I've got grandchildren, a, a boy and a girl. And uh, she's very happy to pick up the dolls and uh, nurture them. Mm. Or, um, but he's much more interested in planes. And he wasn't interested in the teddy bears or dolls or anything like that. <laughs> no, no, no. It's cars mm. and uh, aeroplanes and rockets and. Do, uh, do you know? Do you know? Before I had children, I was I was convinced that it was almost entirely nurture. That <laughs> all of these things were just things that parents, you know. Uh, you know, you go to a shop with your with your child for the first time, and if you've got a girl, you go and buy a baby doll. If you've got a boy, you buy an action man or a car mm-hmm. or something. I just thought it was almost entirely nurture. But now, with a little bit of experience of parenting and things, I just I've I've got much more doubt about that now, and I'm really not <laughs> I'm really unsure how much genetics plays a part. Um, I think we're encouraged these days to believe that almost ent- everything is nurture, and that it's I think it's part of this equality thing in, in that. It's almost um, counterproductive, but but we've, we're trying to assume that everyone starts exactly the same, so that the the things that are affecting how well someone ends up in their career, for example, is all due to the cultural impact, uh, you know, of of how we raise these people or the things that we're, the barriers we're putting in place. I think I think we're encouraged to th- to think like that for equality's sake. Um, and I think also partly because if you start believing that certain people are born with um, better abilities, for example, that's a very dangerous route to go down politically. Um, so, so I think we're at a bit of a junction, which is um, not recognising the role genetics plays for fear of of going down, you know, perhaps we could say racist route or sexist route or whatever the characteristic you want to use is. Do you think that's um, something that's... This hap- would you agree with that? Would you? Would you? Yeah, and I, I think that goes back to so. Therefore, um, let's try and use everybody's potential. So, uh, women, uh, you know, may have uh, a sort of a nurturing potential. Uh, may be really good at mentoring people. Maybe may you know, and and men may be very much more. Um, better at strategy uh, and that type of organisation. Um, I don't know how I've made the leap between learning to play with cars and aeroplanes and. But these thi- and these things. stereotypes but, do but seem to manifest themselves. But these are different yeah. things. I, mm. I I remember some years ago um, somebody saying that. Um, men make uh, better emergency doctors than women because they become less emotional uh, or emotionally involved or emotional about it. I, I don't know whether that's true or and I don't know whether that continues or whether training has, has changed uh, to alter that. Um, but I think it's about... Um, and, of course, there will be differences. There will be some people who who can, you know, do multiple 
you, you know, can overcome their emotions, or you know, men, women that can overcome their emotions, and, and men who can become emotional. So it's it's not it's, it's always not a nuance, absolutely, of course. It's yeah, a of nuance, course. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but again, I think it's about trying to use everybody's potential in a different way. Mm. So. Um, I agree. So going back to right at the beginning, we were talking about um, how do we level the playing field for women, but without uh, making men feel excluded. And, and I think that it's 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 a fine balance, uh, but it but it is a balance we need to think about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, you know, it's uh, and and as you say, nature versus nurture. You know, probably before I had children, I, you know, I thought, well, I. I I wanted to give my children both the same opportunity. Um, so, for example, riding a bike. Uh, and and uh, both were keen on riding a bike and both learned to ride a bike uh, quite quite quickly, you, you know, uh, mm. and they had, that, they had that opportunity. Yeah. And I didn't see a difference between boys and girls. Mm. Um, I, th I, think, I think sometimes um, we can act we unintentionally stifle opportunities by stereotyping girls and boys at, at an early age. That's what I've been really conscious of with my own parenting. But mm -hmm. then I realise it's not just about me and my wife and how we raise. You know, she mm. encounters thousands of people yes. by the time she's sort of 10 or whatever the developmental yeah, kind of that's right. cut off you want to... And, um, and people <coughs> react to children differently. Of course, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, you're right. It's a, it's a minefield... <laughs> It really, is. the it nature it versus nurture thing for me. Yeah, it's something I've just I I ponder on all the time. Um, yeah. Um, I, I also think this it's not a coincidence that you know the the majority of um, primary school teachers are female, for example, and the majority of building site workers, construction workers, are men. I don't think. I mean, some would argue that that's because of um, years and years and years of cultural expectations that has happened like that. And and others would like to try and level out those playing fields, I'm sure as well. But but um, I, I think there comes a point where, as you say, you, you don't want to push people into doing anything specifically because we're trying to level out some sort of quota. It's about giving people the freedom to choose for themselves. And yet, those ones are really specifically tricky problems, particularly the building site thing. Because imagine a woman going to work on a building site that's you know almost all men. How will they feel in that workspace? So there is that boundary that's that's always going to be there. So I don't know. As I say, it's a minefield for me. Uh, yeah. We're going slightly off topic. <laughs> Go on. Did you, did you want no, to add no. That? I mean, it, that, that'll be the same. Uh, you know, in the fire service, for example, I'm mm. sure there are more men than there are women. Mm. Um, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure that. that, that, that and again, it's going back to where where we need to use our people you know with our skills. our skills and our potential yeah. I, I also you know, worry so. that, that certain skills are undervalued and it seems to be predominantly the the nurturing i mean you know people who work in it for example a logic sort of based thing probably get more pay than a, a primary or a nursery teacher mm -hmm. so from a actual um you know money perspective it's it, there's a big imbalance there and god knows how what we do with that because you know, these are these are sort of market forces at play, often I think, and you know, it's not like you can dictate exactly how much someone gets paid all the time. No, no, that's right. I mean, it, it's interesting to note I'm I'm quite old. <laughs> no. <laughs> in the fact that. <laughs> Sorry. In the fact that I trained a long time ago. Yeah. And at that stage, just after I trained, we got equal pay. So. Prior. For physiotherapists. Well. Or healthcare professions. Okay. Um, I think it would be healthcare professions, but I'm not sure. But mm -hmm. um, I think it was prior to the nine, you know, prior to 1982 or something. Um, a male physiotherapist would be paid more than a female physiotherapist, and a male nurse is more than a female nurse. Interesting, isn't it? Obviously. How did that emerge? Was that just a, uh, you know, people who are in charge favouring men, maybe subconsciously or consciously, or or the fact that you know men were more happy to put their hands up and demand pay rises and things like that? How would that? Ever I have... I think it was because I'm I'm not in all fairness I can't I I I don't remember. <laughs> all I remember was that there was a a, a gender you know pay difference. I think there is, still is um, across many industries. But this w this was a specific one that mm. men would be. I think it was because 
they were classified as being the you know the breadwinner, uh, and uh, and that was the reason. But I. I, I'm not not 100 sure on that one, um, <laughs> but, but it's still an- anecdotally interesting. Yeah, and yeah. It, yes, that's right. So it wasn't until about you know the the 1980s uh, that there was equal pay for for doing the same job. Mm. Yeah, you you were on a banding, and that's that's exactly what it is today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about the BU Allied Health Professionals, which I also saw oh, on your yes. research profile? So this is BU yes. as in Bournemouth University. Yeah, so I'm, I'm the sort of uh, ambassador for allied, the Allied Health Professionals, so okay. to speak. So the Allied Health Professions, are, are 40, there are 14 professions. That includes physiotherapy, occupational therapy, radiotherapy, speech therapy, um, drama therapy, um, prosthetics, orthotics. So uh, there are 14 of, of those professions. Um, and um, so um, I sit on the Allied Health Professions Council for Dorset, which is instigated by the um, Integrated Care Board. The Integrated Care Board was the Integrated Care Services, which was previously the CCG, which was the Clinical Conditioning Group. So that's the group in in uh, Dorset that um, oversee health and social care in Dorset. I so see. we have one CCG in Dorset. Not every county has just one CCG. For exa- example, I think Hampshire has two or three uh, CCGs. But in Dorset, we have one CCG that oversees uh, health and social care and there's the sort of commissions the health and social care for, for Dorset. I see and you're part of the leadership team? Part of the leadership team there. Yeah, and what, what, sort of, right. what sort of challenges does that pose and, and what are your aims and goals you know both personally and the the the, the actual allied health professionals group what, what are the aims? So um, the aims are around sort of uh, things like um, workforce planning, um, careers, Allied Health Professions careers. So um, the Allied Health Professions uh, en masse are, are sm- much smaller than nursing. So in the NHS, I think there are about, si- oh, well, over 600,000 nurses and there are over 100,000 doctors. Um, and then the, the next group are the group of Allied Health Professions. Uh, and I, I'm not sure how many of those, about 100,000 or whatever, in the NHS, uh, but it made up of all those small uh, groups, and uh, the biggest group of allied health professions are are physiotherapists. But they're kind of uh, when when you hear on the news, you hear about doctors and nurses. You sometimes you hear paramedics and physiotherapists, but nobody really hears necessarily the rest of the allied health professions. And what we're trying to do is to ensure that allied health professionals also have a career framework, uh, also have um, an ability to progress their careers Mm -hmm. uh, in the NHS. Um, And that's now being recognised a great deal more by the National Institute for Health Research, the NIHR, um, who are uh, building on that and wanting to build research careers for uh, allied health professionals and nurses and midwives. So uh, from, a, from a personal perspective, what I really want to do is to build the research capacity of allied health professionals in Dorset um, uh, and, and uh, to ensure we've got a, a, a pipeline. Uh, so I, um, I work uh, on the um, career development and education um, sort of part of... ARC Wessex, which is the Applied Research Collaboration for Wessex. Lots of acronyms that's to with, remember here, yeah, aren't they? <laughs> that's right. So that's with um, Southampton University, Winchester University and Portsmouth University. Um, and we have been involved in providing internships for clinicians. Uh, they might get... So an internship would involve them having a research area that they would like to study... They come uh, and spend one day a week uh, working on their research. They might do um, a literature review unit uh, with us at Bournemouth University, supervised by a member of staff. 
um, and then they might uh, and that might sort of help them develop their next research question which they might take forward with another bit of funding if you see what I mean right and we've also we also link in with health education England which is no longer because it's now become NHS education NHS E um, South West uh, where would they also give out um, uh, internships um, and then there are so following the internships then there are pre-doctoral internships and then people can go on and do a uh, a, a PhD with NIHR funding. Oh. The good news about NIH, NIHR funding is it it funds your full salary. Now uh, they're highly highly it's highly competitive. Um, what we've also managed at Bournemouth University is to provide match funded student PhD studentships between um, Bournemouth University and you know, it could be University Hospitals Dorset or Dorset County Hospital or Dorset Healthcare. So we've been providing those opportunities as well. So I'm really keen to, you know, grow the careers and grow the research um, in, yeah, in, in Dorset. So mm. that that's my link with um, the allied health professions. So we've, we've set up a group called DAWN, which is Dorset Opportunities in Research Network. Um, uh, and we also, yeah, linking with the Southwest um, and the, the Clinical Research Network, that's the CRN. So lots of lots of these acronyms, mm. <laughs> <laughs> all linking together through all, you. <laughs> well, no, not necessarily, but um, but you know, I that that's the way in which we're trying to sort of yeah, yeah grow the careers. Great. So it keeps yeah. you busy. So it keeps you busy. <laughs> Very yeah. busy by some things. <laughs> uh, you touched on the NHS there. Um, what's your opinion on the current state of the NHS and where we're going with that and, and all that stuff? Do you, how do you see that playing out and whatever? Yeah, I mean, uh, through through these internships, obviously I'm in constant contact with people from the NHS. I mean, probably almost on a daily basis. And we also have all our students spend weeks every year in 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 the nhs as part of their as part of their training um yeah our, our colleagues in the in the nhs are yeah are, are under a lot of strain uh, you know they're um they're working incredibly hard um and and this again is feeding into uh, uh the fact that they can't then necessarily take up the opportunities of the internships because they're just too busy or we can't if they if they were going to be pulled out for a for a day a week for six months uh then the managers are finding it difficult to backfill that that position um we have uh people going into the nhs and thinking whoa i can't work at this pressure all the time and therefore i might work three days in the nhs and two days doing something else in either in private practice or or doing something complete completely different um so yeah there's there's lots of uh yeah lot yeah lots of difficulties so that's why and 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 although uh we've just had the what's it 15 year um workforce plan you know that that may take 10 years for us to notice by the time you've trained trained everybody, trained everybody up and mm. brought the levels up, especially as we are. What is know, the work, workforce plan? Is a, a plan to get more people into working in the NHS. That's right. right. Yeah. So um, the government announced that I think it was last week, <coughs> uh, the fifteen-year workforce plan. This current yeah. government seem keen on disbanding the NHS and sort of running it into the ground in order to promote private healthcare. Would you agree with that? And what your no, thoughts? No, I don't. I don't think. Well, that's not that's not my impression. Mm. Um, and and in relation to the work, the NHS workforce plan, as far as I know, this is fifteen years, uh, and is in both both part or all the parties have agreed to this, so that whoever take you know whoever wins at the next election, it stays. It will stay mm -hmm. in process. It will continue. Okay, that's good. So. 
that you know where, I, where do you think the pressure is coming in terms of funding because it seems underfunded i don't know how true that is but yes and of course or do you think this is just sort of news rhetoric no uh, no 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 i i i i, I do f- feel that it feels underfunded um and i mean is it part of the uh part of the pro- problem with inflation i mean we see that in universities don't we mm. we see that uh, funding for universities through our student through student fees was capped at nine thousand two hundred or was it two fifty? Something remember like that. that. Yeah. Um, in twenty seventeen, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Well, how much is that worth in twenty twenty three? And it, is that the same problem that the NHS are feeling? Mm, could um, be. You know. Uh, Everything costs more. Yes. Salaries have gone up. Mm. Food for you, you know, power for for to keeping the mm. energy, keeping the the, the hospitals going. Uh, IT. Think of the massive IT change mm. in prior to COVID. Um, many of my colleagues probably had access to a computer. They certainly didn't have their own computer in the NHS, and yet overnight. Everybody, you know, many people were doing face-to-face consultations. Think of that massive change um, uh, in the IT system. So do you think this is a problem that, that will rectify itself over time? Or, or do you think this is a downward trajectory that needs drastic change in order to sort of save the NHS? I don't think I know enough about it uh, to, to, to say. Um, I, I, I enjoy talking to academics because you're very careful and very um, uh, measured in your response to things. And it's very opposite to the sensationalist sort of news opinions and things we hear on social media. I think that's the, why I most enjoy doing this podcast. Because <laughs> I'm talking to people who, you know, genuinely think deeply about things and then are careful with what they say so as not to you know kick up the dust or whatever you want to say <laughs> and i enjoy it. i like that you you know you're measured in your responses here you know if it's not your area of expertise most of the guests i've had on just say i'd rather not comment right which yeah. is which i think we could use more of in the world yeah maybe. <laughs> people saying that people saying i don't know i don't want to comment because i'm not sure <laughs> and that to be an acceptable thing as well you know yes yeah. we put these people in in front of a tv in front of a camera and you expect them to answer everything like they, they're the oracle <laughs> yeah and yeah if we sit here and we're actually we, we have very little expertise exactly exactly which is why i'm asking you all the questions and hope that you might yeah <laughs> yeah no i i mean in in my heart i i, I worked in the nhs mm. i don't work in the nhs now because i'm an academic but um you know i uh i think it's a fantastic institution um and uh and the work that colleagues have done, and uh, there are some excellent elements of the NHS. I- I- imagine, you know, uh, your GP can see an X-ray uh, that was taken in the hospital, um, and if you went to another hospital, they would be able to access that X-ray. Nowhere in the world, a- a- else in the world, can that sort of thing happen? Because mm, if you if you if you have that, yeah. if you if you go if for example if you go to the states and you have your X-ray done in one hospital. Uh, is that almost that, owned by that hospital? <laughs> is it the copyright of that hospital? That's almost? probably the copyright of that that hospital. Crikey, you, you, I've never that even sharing. That. Mm. Uh, sometimes people are allowed their notes, but um, and X-rays. Mm. Uh, just it depends on different places, but yeah. very often you can't take those round with you. Wow, and so mm. much medical advancement has come out of the NHS as well, hasn't it? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I, I, I was I I almost applied. To, um, for funding to produce an NHS film, but in the end, it was just too much on my plate at the time. But um, I, I remember reading a big long list of like a hundred things that the NHS has produced in terms of research or advancements. Can't remember any of them off the top of my head right now. Um, uh, but yeah, it was just amazing to me. Yeah. Do, do you know any of any of them? <laughs> so we can give some examples the, now. Oh, what the NIHR? Oh, oh no, mean, just some of the advancements that the NHS has made in terms of medical research or anything like that. I can't think. Of, uh, is penicillin one of them or something like that? I can't remember now. Well, that that yes. Yeah, so I wish I'd researched it before that this so might have been was that uh i can't remember whether that's post nhs or pre-nhs uh 
Yes, yeah, so I, 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 you know, but but yes, absolutely. There have been many. Uh, I'll have to link to that document yeah. in the in the in the comment section okay. or something, so, yeah. so people can look at that for themselves because right. I can't remember but, off the top of but, my head. But right there now. are many advancements. But um, uh, you know, I mean, for example, uh, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine that was developed in Oxford will have been developed in conjunction with the NHS. Mm. All the NIHR funding that is given for research is aimed at making sure that the research is um, is driven by clinical need. So that's why they want clinicians engaged in the research, working with a university to help them with the sort of methodology and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and the other thing is uh, the NIHR really wants the patient's voice to come through on research. So that isn't, it isn't just for clinicians to improve um, assessment or interventions, but interventions that patients feel that they could be engaged with and research that patients feel that they've had a say in. So mm. uh, in healthcare research and, and social care, we try and get the voice of, uh, you know, our patients, our clients, uh, in in that in that re- research, in the interventions that we carry out, so that any intervention. So, for example, if you want to get somebody uh, uh, engaged in exercise, what is it that will help them engage in exercise? We all know that exercise is good for you. We all know that you know being physically active is good for you. But what keeps us going? What keep you know? And that that's mm. that's a magic pill that you know nobody has necessarily has the answer mm. to. Yeah. I mean, in <laughs> the um, I can give you an answer for my experience, from my absolutely. own personal experience. It was always about being part of a team and not wanting to let the team down. So I, I've always played football all my life, and yeah. um, waking up on a Sunday morning in the freezing cold of December, you know, I, if I, if it was an individual thing, I would never have gone out. I would have just said, "No, I'm staying in bed." <laughs> But there's a there's a team of players expecting you to show up, and if you don't, there'll be a player short, you know. And if everyone did that, we would never be able to play any games. So then you go out, you do it, and then within ten minutes, the cold is gone because you're boiling hot, <laughs> running around, yeah. and it's fine. Do you know what I mean? So for me, it was always about not wanting to let other people down. I, I imagine for some people that they're, they're more it's about not wanting to let themselves down, perhaps. But for me, it was never about that. It was about not wanting to let other people down. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that that's really good to hear. The it, it's interesting. Um, we looked at uh, community-based exercise groups mm. um, uh, in Dorset um, to see what kept people going. Uh, and what kept people going was the social interaction. Mm-hmm. So the social interaction is really important. And, and, and more important probably, interestingly enough, for women. Okay. <laughs> Certainly women of that age group that mm. was in their um, 50s and above or 60s and above. Right. Um, uh, because they liked the socialization afterwards so the exercise was part of it but but having a, a cup of tea afterwards was, was the really icing on the re- cake the icing on the cake <laughs> absolutely but you're right you know team uh, team games and and doing things with others mm. uh, so things like you know taking your dog for a walk um that that can be an important element because you know you've got to walk the dog. Yes, it's not yeah. you're not doing it for yourself. You're mm. doing it for somebody else. You, mm. oh, some the dog, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or some something else, or <laughs> your your pet or whatever. Uh, but I think you're right. You know, uh, we need to be able to, and and so we need to be able to engage with somebody. Um, so uh, and for somebody else to be saying have you done your exercises today yeah, yeah, yeah. or uh, <laughs> um, and, and and some sort of encouragement and I, so that we can get back to them yeah yeah i've done mine I've done. <laughs> i used to always dread that question when i was having physio you know how well have you been getting on with your exercises because as soon as i went home you know other things got in the way and i was never very good at keeping up with yeah physiotherapy whenever i had it no 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 i'm, mm. I'm sure and that and that's the same with everybody mm. and so that has uh, that's something that we kind of need to learn from mm. um you know what what keeps people going and it would be better to have a sort of group rehabilitation yeah that uh, requires people with the same sort of injuries at the same time perhaps or something i think you could adapt it mm. i think you could we used to uh i know when i uh back in the 80s <laughs> um 
we used to we used to adapt uh, adapt a, se- a session for footballers. Um, I mean, at that stage, I, I'm I think they were Chelsea footballers um, because they didn't have a, a phys- physiotherapy at that stage, wow. and they used to come <laughs> along to the gym. Can you imagine that now, following their you know uh, a knee. Uh, you know some knee injury mm. um and we used to have the kind of uh the active knee class or something something oh, like I that see. but we would adapt it for each each person mm. but they would spend a minute on each station I uh, see. and uh you know you, the physio would be there facilitating mm. encouraging mm. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure that would work well now as well uh, wh- while we're on the subject of exercise and sort of barriers to exercise and things we had a really interesting conversation um on the our online video call uh, mm-hmm. last week or whenever it was um about some of the barriers that women face particularly after giving birth with pelvic floor muscles could you enlighten us on that a little bit yeah because um, it opened my eyes massively when um when you sort of told me the, the origin and then what it can lead to yeah yeah so uh, you know fol- following childbirth uh for a new numerous regions and, and even during pregnancy uh women's pelvic floor muscles uh can become weaker um or it and that might be during pregnancy it might be the pressure of the baby uh, uh and well the pre- pressure of uh the yeah, yeah gravity and, and and the baby and the and and the, the fluid in uh, in the womb that's pressing down on the pelvic floor that can make you a bit more liable to uh leak leak urine um and with that comes that sort of feeling of not wanting to do things it might be not wanting to go out because you'll need to uh, spend a penny uh, more regularly um, but post postnatally uh, that can be quite quite common uh, you know uh, I, I can't remember the statistics offhand but I think it's somewhere between 35% and 50% of women postnatally uh, may have some sort of urine leak and uh, and therefore, m- many women are able to try and get access to uh, to a pelvic health physio uh, to um, to address that problem. Sort of within sort of about six weeks um, of having of having their baby. Uh, having said that, um, I don't know how. It probably depends on where you are as to how much. Um, focus there is in that area mm. as to whether you get access um, but this can be really important because 80% of um, uh, stress incontinence can be treated by just uh, c- getting contracting your pelvic floor muscles uh, and learning to contract them again so when I say learning to contract them again if, for example, you have um, had pain uh, somewhere, uh, you may um, your your brain may kind of be inhibited in contracting those muscles. I now see. you might you might remember that with your knee. So mm. uh, when you had your initial knee injury, probably the physiotherapist would have said, "Oh, you, you know, you're not quite contracting your quadriceps muscle." as you were before it's still problematic now to be honest right okay yeah, yeah. so sometimes that and, and that will be the same with the pelvic floor muscles now okay. of course with the pelvic floor muscles we can't see them but we can feel them having said that some women don't quite understand how to contract those uh, pelvic floor muscles and that's where a session with a pelvic floor physiotherapist who can teach you how to contract your muscles can be really helpful and then you can go away and, and practice that. Mm. Now, the the research suggests that you need to be practicing uh, daily and several times daily for about three months for that to, you know, to work. Anecdotally, uh, we hear that many women, you know, that that uh, they can get a a good result in in less time. Mm. Uh, and once they get the feeling of contracting their muscles, then they can remember to contract them um, uh, and, and, and keep them contracted. Now, um, 
uh, so that you know when they sneeze or whatever they don't leak or when they try and run because again I think we were talking about activity if for example uh, you leak every time you try and go for a run that's going to probably put you off going for a run mm. or uh, playing with the children jumping on the trampoline and being being active so it may be one reason why women are less physically active than men we do know that women are less physically active uh, than men um, and and then that that plays out through life so when women go through the menopause uh, their muscles get weaker that's all part of that 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 change um, we can see that sometimes in the leg muscles and the arm muscles um, but that also happens uh, with your pelvic floor muscles. So right. again, they may that may be a time where they begin to leak again, and that may be a time where they need to think about contracting their pelvic floor muscles and 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 and, and re reengaging them. You know, because it may be for a, for periods of many years they haven't leaked, and then then postmenopausally or pre mm. or during the menopause, they may. Uh, begin to begin to leak again so this is sort of a circular problem in that the muscles relax naturally which makes you perhaps leak urine which makes you less likely to exercise which means your muscles yeah become that's right weakened over time that's so it's right. just a circular okay yeah but it, it going through the menopause then that that's that's because of the sort of hormonal changes mm -hmm. that it's that's your natural uh, progression is that women weaken and they certainly seem to weaken more than the men so they have we, we talk about osteo um we, we yeah we talk about uh, uh their you know muscle weakness but we also talk about changes to their bones mm -hmm. but but i also spoke about the fact that so if you're less physically active then things like your balance uh become you, you're, you're not challenging your balance any longer or, or as much mm -hmm. so you then become more likely to fall right. um, and obviously when you get older um, uh, we know for example in it, you know the second commonest reason for going into a nursing home is because somebody has uh, urinary incontinence and do the statistics show that and also uh, that older women fall more than older men because of this balance thing the, it will be that that's right yeah. that w women do fall more uh, more likely to then fracture their neck of femur so it's probably a combined thing they're they're more likely to fall but then when they do fall they're more likely to fracture because of the osteoporosis that comes with uh get, get, getting older which all stems uh, could potentially all stem from the pelvic floor muscle thing problem right from the start so this is quite small it, relatively speaking issue can lead to much greater issues later that's on. that's right difficult to say mm. because on the way there are probably many complex issues yeah, of course. that happen but these are yeah these are things that we need to we need to consider mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely yeah. Uh, and this is a really prevalent thing for me because my wife's um nan has just gone into a care home because she had a fall broke mm -hmm. her ankle um and perhaps you know they're not sure if she'll be coming out and my nan has also just gone into a care home, uh, partly because of incontinence, um, and she's in there now. That's you know where she lives now. Yeah. So it's really you know both of those things are really um, uh, yeah. What's the word? Oh, crikey, sorry, <laughs> the mic. Uh, both really prevalent for me right at the, right at the moment. Yeah, and um, and I, and I think the the other thing is that uh, it, this is something that nobody, not many people, want to talk about. Yeah. Women don't talk about their incontinence. Mm. Women think that following uh, childbirth and the fact that they're leaking is just a minor problem. <laughs> and they don't uh, come forward and try and contact anybody to, uh, yeah, to, um, to get any help. It, it just, may be it's because... It's sort of an acceptance of it. It's like, okay, yes, this is my body now sort of thing. That's right. right. But, and very often they don't actually even, even share it with mm. with anybody mm. uh and uh more recently we've had um 
midwives, so midwives, when they see people antenatally, will say to them, you know, how are you today? You know, and the person says, oh, yeah, no, all's fine, you know, and they'll do the antenatal examination as they would. They're now beginning to say, have you got any uh, urinary leakage? And they're quite surprised at the number of women who have urinary leakage uh, in antenatally before, you know, before birth, uh, and that's much more prevalent than they had anticipated. Mm. Um, but they're just not forthcoming with that when you ask, are there any problems? They that's don't right. You need to be very specific about the question. Exactly. And mm. it might be because when somebody comes to uh, talk about their baby, they think that the clinician is focused on the baby. Mm. So for that, uh, that a, a midwife is focused on the baby. It's just like... If you come to see a physiotherapist, you probably tell them about their leg, your leg pain and your knee pain, but you won't tell them that you've got postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome or gastrointestinal problems, which earlier on in our conversation were some of the symptoms that people with Ilias Danlos have. So they don't just have one thing. So they may come to see the physiotherapist because they've got knee pain or back pain or chronic pain, but then they don't necessarily think the physiotherapist wants to hear that they've got all these other which issues, could all be linked which are all linked mm. uh you know and chronic fatigue etc so do so some of those sorts of things aren't aren't shared whereas mm. if you go to see your gynecologist you'll probably tell them about your gyneco- gynecological problems but you might not tell them that you get migraines or mm. or, or whatever you so people choose uh, thinking that the clinician will only want to hear about the the one thing. I, th- yeah. I think that's part of the problem. Mm, yeah. yeah. So the message is, talk more about this. Absolutely. Understand it's a problem that yep. starts from a ve- fairly uh, relatively trivial point, but can lead to much bigger problems down the line. That's so, right. So sort it out early if you can. Yeah, and I mean there are. Um, we reckon that probably you, you know there will be children at school, also who have urinary leakage that keep very quiet about it. Um, and it, it, you know, it might be something that really needs to be addressed, you know, earlier on in, in schools mm. uh, as well to sort of, uh, so that young girls know about it uh, beforehand. Well. Yeah. Shall we talk about the images that you brought in today? Or yes, that you sent certainly. to me, rather. Yeah. Um, so I think we'll start with this one underneath because you already mentioned that earlier on. Uh, so for those watching on YouTube or on Spotify, you can watch on Spotify as well. Um, this is a poster for the Centre for Midwifery and Women's Health at Bournemouth University. Can you talk to us a little bit about this, uh, if you haven't already? Yeah, so as I um, ex- explained earlier, we've recently changed the Centre for Midwifery, Maternal and Perinatal Health to include women's health. Uh, and in order to shorten the name, <laughs> we've called it the Centre for Midwifery and Women's Health. Uh, and we're going to be launching that um, on Friday, July the 14th, 2023, <laughs> um, in case you're watching afterwards. Um, and uh, we, the research is covering uh, four broad themes uh, in the Centre of Midwifery and Women's Health, and that is care in early labour, infant feeding um, and postnatal care, improving care for mothers and babies in low and mid-income in com- countries and then and women's health. Um, Just a quick interruption from me here to say that the microphone audio does cut out. Thankfully, it's only for two minutes and we do still have audio on the camera, so it shouldn't affect your enjoyment of the podcast too much. And in, in, in relation to women's health, we will be looking at, at the broader perspective of women's health, not just women's pelvic health, but women's health through the lifespan. And also, we've got uh, uh, we've got sports and sport and exercise and sports psychology programmes here at Bournemouth University. We will definitely be looking at women's health in sport. Um, really important now that we're seeing professional footballers uh, come back uh, to uh, to their professional game following um, you know maternity leave and needing to get back into playing as you know fully fledged you know sports women mm. um, so th- these these elements are really important obviously we've seen some uh, athletes coming back uh, to sport 
following, uh, you know, the birth of babies. I mean, you, I mean, for example, you've seen Serena Williams, the way she came back. Uh, she she did a great job coming back mm. after the birth of her her child. Um, and we need to make sure that you know everyone is being supported to come back to their profession, professional sport. Well, even non-professional sport. Um, uh, in you know to main to help maintain their their fitness and Absolutely. careers. Yeah. Could we take a break there? Because I've just realised that the SD card on the microphones has. Um, run out of space okay and i don't know how long it's been like that luckily we're recording audio on there as well it might not be as good i apologize to everyone listening if the sound has deteriorated halfway through this podcast i'm really sorry i hopefully we, we've got most of it i've only just looked down and realized it's stopped recording um but uh, i need a toilet break as well anyway as it happens <laughs> fairly topically so can we continue in about five ten minutes absolutely is that okay thank you. okay thank thanks. You. Okay, uh, welcome back. We just had a quick break. Um, I've now put a, an, an SD card back in the uh, audio recorder. That's another uh, haphazard error that uh, occurs when you're doing these things solo. So I do apologise for anyone who's been listening uh, and the audio, as I say, um, got worse halfway through. Hopefully we got most of that stuff um, captured nicely through these mics to begin with. Um, great. So we, we talked about the Centre for Midwifery and Women's Health, which uh, is, this is launching, you say, on this coming Friday, which we've already said the date, so we don't need to repeat that. Um, what about what about these images here? What, what do these mean to you? Um, so uh, the image at, at the top, um, I have a, a niece who is, is good at drawing. Uh, and I said to her, when I was sort of... Uh, Doing, trying to disseminate my research uh, around Ilias Danlos and joint hypermobility syndrome, uh, I wanted an image that I could have on a slide. Um, and I, I showed her a picture uh, and she, uh, she drew that for me. Wow. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an image that I have on many slides when I'm, when I'm talking about uh, joint hypermobility syndrome, Ilias Danlos syndrome. Uh, so that's that picture. And then the one. How, how old is your niece? I'm sorry. Is she oh, adult? Oh, she's adult now. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But but she was she was still at school when she uh, she really? drew it for me. That's so fantastic, I, isn't I it? I still I still use it. And it makes for a nice sort of a logo, almost like a branding yes, type thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so really that, great. That's what I use. And mm. then uh, and in fact, I think we used it uh, for the um, we had a pain conference. I think it was in two thousand and. 14 or 15 we had a Dorset pain conference and I, I had it on, on my lo as a logo for that as well mm. um, and then the, the, the picture below is a, a, a picture uh, of uh, Oman uh, it's a, um, uh, a lovely picture up what we would call a wadi which is a dry riverbed mm. I mean there is actually water at, at the bottom <laughs> of that riverbed a tiny, bed, a oh, tiny there's a little bit, bit of water a bit, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, that just kind of reminds me because my first uh, published um, work was uh, a prevalent study of joint hypermobility syndrome in Oman. Oh, right. That, so that's, that's a really uh, beautiful image, isn't it? It's, it's a beautiful stunning. image. I mean, it's a beautiful country, mm. Oman, uh, and uh, we thoroughly enjoyed living there. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, blue tack both of those up on the wall. I've forgotten to get the blue tack out this morning as well, so that <laughs> that's another thing, but I'll put them up. Um, after after we're done, uh, okay. The, the final thing I just I just really want to ask is more of a, a general question, uh, which is um, in, in your own in your own words, you know, why do you think research and academic research, um, in particular, is is so important? Um, yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I, I think um, in in respect to uh, physiotherapy, um, many of the things we do are don't have an evidence base uh, if we are going to continue uh, paying for that therapy uh, in the NHS then I, I believe we need to have the evidence behind it um, what, what sort of things do you mean when that don't have an evidence base examples are like some of the exercises you prescribe and things like this or it might be the type of exercise and it might be the number of exercises that we prescribe. Uh, but again, it goes back to, uh, we clearly need to ensure uh, that we engage a person in those exercises. There's no point in us giving out exercises and then nobody's doing them. Um, 
we need to understand why people are not doing them if if we're going if they're going to come to the physio physiotherapist mm -hmm. and it's a hard topic to uh, to broach with uh, a patient because whenever I've not done my exercises I feel per firstly guilt yep and secondly um, that I'm undermining the, the physiotherapist who's given me those exercises and neither of those things are the things that I want to openly share with the physiotherapist does that make sense yeah absolutely so uh, and yet you got better well, you could argue it's it's hard to know whether uh, my improvement would have been quicker or maybe my uh, just talking about my knee right now whether it would be stronger than it is today if I'd continued with my physio better you know if I'd been really stringent like I'm sure there are some people who do it you know really really well um, I've just never been very good at uh, foresight and <laughs> looking after myself particularly well and and so I think in in those cases and 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 everybody is different mm. we we've, we've recognised that all the way along here. Um, so therefore, understanding that some people will go away and do their exercises and others need some help. Mm. What sort of help do they need in order to do those exercises in order to make that knee as strong as possible so they're not going to get re-injured in football the following week or in, you know, in three months' time? Mm. And I think those are the sorts of things that we need to be looking at. Now, it's not easy research. It's um, and there isn't an easy methodology. It's not like doing a randomised controlled trial, mm. um, where you're taking one tablet with a placebo and and looking at the difference. You know, it it, it requires some creative uh, methodologies, and in, in in order for us to understand how people think about their exercises. But if we could work out those people who uh, will go away and do their exercises, okay. But those people who want some help, want some, you know, uh, social interaction with the exercises, mm. um, then then we can make these interventions more bespoke. For example, it might be that uh, it, if you were to have a competition with other other people around doing your exercises. Uh, and be linked in with other people and be feeding back to your therapist on a weekly basis or daily basis, these are the exercises I'm, I'm doing, and you get a thumbs up or so something like that for doing the exercises. Are those the sorts of things that will motivate? Some people they will mm. motivate, others they won't. But it, it's about how do we get that engagement? Mm. Yeah. Um, for, for me going in and seeing the physiotherapist was uh, good motivation and it would sort of spike my motivation for a short while um, you know and then day to day routines take over uh, habit forming is always a difficult thing I think forming a new habit you know that's right it's sort of like this you, you fight internally against yourself whenever you're trying to make a good new habit that's right and I mean um, personally I, I, I think I know when I, I worked in a uh, an American sports medicine uh, clinic uh, and uh, for a short time, and I think uh, bringing people in on a daily basis, it was part of their daily routine to come in and do their rehabilitation. Well, that that helped them mm -hmm. uh, because they they had to do it. They you know <coughs> they they were bought into it. They came in. They did uh, did that over a number of weeks until they were fit enough to to go back and and, and play. Mm -hmm. But that isn't something uh, that's on offer, uh, you know, necessarily in the NHS. Yeah, uh, course, yeah. And so we've got to sort of uh, think of different ways around this and ways of uh, encouraging people and, in and getting people engaged. Mm. Because a lot of this you can do on your own. Uh, but, it, but as you say, it, it requires a motivation. Mm. Um, so you see the job as researchers, not just focusing on the injury itself, which I'm sure there's lots and lots of research into knee injuries, for example, but also the, the approach that That's medical right. professionals take to this. And, and, yep. and there must be all sorts of different ways you can research this field. Yes. In that respect. Yeah. Yes. And everything in life. <laughs> yeah, and ev everything in life. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, I suppose, you know, my, my areas of thinking, thinking about health and social care research, um, there's... There's so much we do that is good, but we, we don't necessarily have the evidence behind it. Uh, so that when clinical commissioning groups are saying, well, where's the evidence that that is effective and that that has an impact and that improves people's outcome by 20% or, you know, or their quality of life by X, uh, sometimes we don't have that information. Mm. And I think it's it more and more important that we're able to 
to justify dem justify and demonstrate yeah. that information going forward mm. yeah and as you say that could be applied generally more broadly for all research in all aspects of life yes one would assume well i i would <laughs> assume yeah, yeah yeah i mean i'm sure that's happening all the time in things like marketing mm. i mean you wouldn't carry on with something if you found that uh it didn't improve a market would you you know, if you were advertising something and it, it didn't... So even informal sort of research is... Absolutely. Yeah, same I mean, sort of thing. For example, in, in media, I imagine that if the, the number of people watching a programme drops off, you probably... Reconsider what you're doing recon in some way. <laughs> that's right. Mm. Uh, and I think that's those are the sorts of things that we try and do in the health service. We, do, You know, people do service evaluations to check that the, evaluate, uh, check that the service that they're doing... Uh, is right for the for the patients at the time and and the other thing is that people change and the way in which we behave change as we will you know uh younger people will behave in a different way to older people younger mm. people might might be <coughs> very happy with online consultations older people you know find the technology just too difficult mm. and want a face-to-face -face com you know a, a, a proper face-to-face -face, uh, consultation so, so so these sorts of studies really are a never-ending um thing as culture changes and shifts over time we need to redo re readdress these issues over and over again so it's really, right. really is a never-ending uh, endeavor yeah really yeah yeah all right fantastic i think we'll, we'll, we'll finish it there uh, professor Cla carol clark thank you so much for joining me on the podcast i've really enjoyed it i think your work is amazing insightful um and really uh, worthy of uh, of you know the uh, effort you put into it um and ho hopefully you know it leads to better better uh, health for everyone and and women specifically thank you tom thank you very much <laughs> you're welcome <laughs>